they touch me is consequences that come with that. I call you next. Hey, Lee, they trying to steal our shit. I feel like a lot of people took away the negative from that. Yeah, I can lie. It's trademark, and I own the trademarks, and it's public record. Right? Like, ain't nobody got to lie about, bro. Pull up like with 20 niggas with ski masks. Like, super hating. Like, ain't nobody trying to hear you not in the street, nigga. But she ain't uh, never paid for not one of them. I'm not finna die for this shit. I'm trying to tell. They died the first thing I'm saying. For this shit. Man, he had potential to grow up. I ain't never up. touched none of y'all. I ain't never did. I don't owe y'all any shit. I don't owe y'all any shit. I killed a boy, I'm going to prison. You can out internet me, but you can't out business me and, and out grind me. We are here on another episode of Address It. Um, we are doing vote, voter awareness for this upcoming election, November 7th. City Council um, is the big, big thing on the ballot, one of the biggest things on the ballot, if not the biggest. I'm honored to be able to sit with uh, our current Ward 5 City Council member, Jeremiah Ellison. How are you, sir? I'm doing pretty good. I'm happy to be here. So, yeah. so you know, we got we to gotta come talk to you. You know, you've mm -hmm. been in office um, first. What is it, six years now? Almost six years, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, how does it feel? You know, how does it feel coming up for re-election, mm -hmm. being, being um, in office for six years, you know? Yeah, well, you know, I'm born and raised on the north side, uh, lived here my whole life, worked, you know, as a lifeguard, worked at Juxta as a teaching artist, like, you know, worked, lived and worked on the north side my whole life. And so it's been quite an honor to be on the city council, to represent my neighbors. I feel like I've gotten a lot done uh, and so the campaign is always an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, but Northside, you know, it's a difficult place to serve folks, right? Folks have a lot of need. We have a lot of uh, 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 we have a lot of struggles on the north side. We also have a lot of beauty on the north side. And I always want to make sure that we never uh, get lost in that. We never like ignore that part of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been good. Um, I like to just. Uh, from your perspective, what would you say the city council role is? What are you guys' responsibilities? Yeah. What, 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 is, what, what can we blame you guys for? <laughs> for sure, <laughs> for sure. Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, the city council basically, we're, we're almost like the finance department. I hate to put it so simple like that, but we vote on the budgets. We also vote on policy, right? And so uh, the mayor is, you, you juxtapose that to the mayor's role, which the mayor's role is to tell everybody in the city uh, what to do. Not the city council, but like the people who fill the potholes, the people who plow the streets, the police, the fire department. He tells them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. We write policy that help guide their work. Mm -hmm. uh, and we approve their budgets. Right, okay. Yep. So y'all decide if they need more or less. Yeah. Uh, um, so what's going on with the snow? I know you talk about the roads and stuff. You know, a lot of it's a lot of complaints. You know, we the last person to get our stuff snowed. Mm -hmm. We, you know, in the city, um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, equity and snow delivery is is important. Again, that's the mayor's role in terms of telling who people what to do, where to go, when. Um, but as the city council member, when I'm noticing those discrepancies, obviously, it's my job to complain about that. And so, um, you know, talking to the mayor's office, talking to the departments making sure that we can have equity um, in, in the snow plowing is, is really important. Now, obviously, they're always going to tell you, oh, council member, it's equitable, right? Uh, but we live, the, we live it on the ground. We, we, we kind of know, we know how it feels. I think the real disparity um, that I'm looking to get a hold of is the towing, right? Like, it's one thing for the snow plows to come in late. It's a whole other thing for us to be towed first. And the reason that happens is because we're so close, uh, and these tow trucks know that, you know, they're traveling a shorter distance to bring our cars to the impound lot. Uh, they're going to get paid faster that way. And so trying to, trying to ensure that we are not getting picked on uh, disproportionately when it comes to towing, uh, especially around snow emergencies, that first snowfall, all that stuff, uh, it becomes a huge problem. So making sure that there's equity there um, is a big part of the advocacy that I do at City Hall. Uh, you know, as I'm, as I'm driving, I'm seeing, you know, this, uh, two, three lanes is turning into two. You know, the bike lanes look like they're getting bigger. Mm -hmm. What's going on with our streets? Yeah, overnight? yeah. You know, no, I think uh, a lot of Northsiders will, will know well uh, that how much speeding is an issue, right? Mm -hmm. People speed uh, and uh, 
And especially when the lanes are wider, when the uh, uh, when there's more lanes, all that stuff. When our when our city streets are basically highways, miniature highways, uh, that's when you see a lot of speeding getting encouraged. And so a lot of that stuff is designed to make sure that we can bring down the overall average speeds in and around our neighborhoods. Now it's a tricky thing, right? It's, it can feel a little bit like whack-a-mole because the second that you're slowing things down here, you know. People who want to drive the speed limit are going to drive appropriately. People who want to speed might go find a new street to speed on. And so it becomes a constant battle of making sure that the roads are safe, uh, that that uh, that people can that kids can play in the front yard and then not get you know, they're not going to be in danger if the ball rolls out into the street or something like that. Uh, and so uh, you might notice around North High or around, um, you know, Hall, uh, especially around the, the high school, the, the schools, there was a federal program. The state, pro the state replicated it, we replicated it, called Safe Routes to Schools. Mm -hmm. And so you see more roundabouts, you see more bump outs, you see uh, you know, a little bit more infrastructure that helps the roads be safer for communities, right? And not just miniature highways where people can fly down Emer Emerson, fly down Fremont, fly down uh, you know, Girard, fly down uh, you know, 17th or 14th or, or Plymouth, right? Uh, so all that stuff's really an effort to make sure that we can have safe safer streets yeah um how will that affect law enforcement you know when they in pursuits stuff like that well you know the pursuit policy is outside of the council's purview right i got no legal uh grounds there but i do have good relationships at the fourth precinct and uh and in the mayor's office and so i try to lend my voice to those things as as as, as they uh as they come up um if anything, it's gonna make it really harder to speed if you are in pursuit, if the police are in pursuit of somebody. It's gonna make that person, you know, if they gotta go around a roundabout, if they gotta do all those things, definitely gonna make it harder for them um, uh, to get away from police and to hit that top, those top end speeds that they want to. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing though, regarding the pursuit policy is, uh, you know, people tend to speed when we do chase them. And so, uh, and we noticed that, you know, like, for instance, Lionel Frazier, who is, the, I believe, the uncle of, the, um, of Darnella Frazier, who was the woman who filmed, the young woman, I think was a child at the time, filmed George Floyd's uh, murder. Mm -hmm. uh, her uncle was killed by police because they were in a pursuit. It was a dangerous pursuit. Um, I think the law enforcement have to be mindful that they're not, that they're not accidentally killing and hitting pedestrians when they're pursuing somebody else, right? That doesn't create safety. And so I think the point is that we've got to make everything safer, right? Um, that person who's speeding and, and who's fleeing from the police, sure, they're at fault, right? But we have a responsibility as public officials, as police officers, as firefighters, to not harm the public while we're trying to do our jobs, right? Uh, Wasn't and, there a no, uh, no chase policy or? Uh, you know, the no chase policy is something that the, that the chief would really have to discuss in detail. But mm -hmm. here's what I know about the no chase policy is that, uh, you know, it used to be that you could just be pursuing people all the time. Now there's certain limitations so that we can have less pursuits because so many people were getting hit uh, during these pursuits. Uh, and, uh, and it's much easier just to get the license plate, let that person go, ID them, let them go. If they're no longer being chased, nine times out of 10, they are gonna eventually slow down when they realize they're not being chased. And if we have their identity and we have their license plate, we can get that person later and it's yeah. safer to the community, it's safer to all that kind of stuff. So. The no chase policy is conditional. I, I can't remember all the rules and regulations. That's, that's really the legal realm of the mayor and the chief. But, um, but from what I know of it, there's been an effort to make sure that uh, you know, there's less police involved crashes uh, and pedestrian deaths uh, when it comes to the chase policy. Um, I want you to just inform us a little bit about the, the Blue Line project, mm -hmm. um, you know, what it is, you know, yeah. why, why it's where it's at, you sure. know, what are uh, the benefits, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Blue Line project is a project, uh, 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 you know, being helmed by the county and the Met Council. Um, and, uh, you know, they're the project team. They create the route. They create the line. They do the community engagement. Um, the cities, not just the city of Minneapolis, but the cities along the route, Obviously, we get invited into their project to give our input, uh, but ultimately it's their project and, and we often have to be advocates uh, for what our communities need in those projects, right? So we're not a part of the project team, but obviously we gotta lend our voice to make sure that the project looks the way we want it to look. Um, <clears throat> You know, the blue supposed line to come down Broadway and Lindale, though, correct? Uh, not Lindale. No. So it's so the blue line as it stands is supposed to leave 
um, the Twin Stadium, uh, head down 10th on, uh, up to Washington, go up Washington to 21st. They're going to build a new bridge across 21st. This is the current iteration of the line. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very much a project in progress, right? So this, everything I'm saying could change you know, as people speak up, as people lend their voice to it, as people let me know what they want me to tell the project team and all that kind of stuff. Build a bridge across 21st from Washington, uh, and then the line would run down 21st until, you know, you know Broadway curves. Yeah. And so it essentially run down 21st until it eventually hits West Broadway uh, around, uh, I want to say Irving. Maybe I got the street like a little wrong there, but I think around Irving, it would pop out there, and then it would be on West Broadway, headed up out into the suburbs. So that's the current iteration of the line. The original line was to come down Lindale and then turn on onto West Broadway. And there were a lot of issues with that, with that alignment. But mainly the, na the neighbors, the people who live in on Lindale said, hey, look, in order for there to be transit-oriented development, in order for you to build this line, in order for there to be enough room for street, for cars and the train and everything, you're gonna have to eat up a lot of our backyards and you're gonna have to displace some of us permanently in order to build this line. And it was really that community advocacy. That's what I, but that's what I mean when people think some of these projects are inevitable and that they don't have a voice in them. The Blue Line project is being shaped by community voices as we speak, right? Now, it's hard fought. You gotta be joining force with your neighbors. You gotta reach out to me. You gotta, you know, we gotta join for our voices to go talk to the project team and push them and challenge them to make changes. Um, but the reason that it got moved off of Lindale was really because the community did a good job of helping the project team understand why Lindale was not the best option and why Washington was going to be a better option um, in the long run for that infrastructure. You oh, so it was. It was supposed to be Lindale and then... And then the community advocated okay. to get it moved. And so if the community could do it once, then we could do it twice. If, if there are things that people want to see out of that project, then I think that we, we should be working hard to get what we need out of that project. Here's, you asked why the, blue, why the Blue Line would come through North Minneapolis at all. I, I think a lot of folks don't know, maybe people do know, North Minneapolis has the highest uh, transit ridership in the state of Minnesota, right? We basically pay for uh, you know, the bus system, the train system, all that stuff. So we ride the bus and the train the most on the north side, but we don't have the best infrastructure. We don't have the best bus shelters. We don't have the best uh, everything that public transit has to offer. And the train is a massive investment, um, permanent transit infrastructure, uh, that could serve us really well. I think that the, the challenge is, how do you ensure that the train is a net benefit and not a harm to the community? Well, you gotta have a lot of policy around the train, anti-displacement policy. You gotta make sure that the businesses on the corridor can have site control, that there are plans to help those businesses stay afloat during construction. These are all the things that a lot of Northsiders are fighting for right now as we consider the project. The project can be a net good, um, but you gotta fight for it to be a net good. And if it's not gonna be good, if at the end of the day, folks believe that, that the project will ultimate, is ultimately coming together in a way that's gonna harm North Minneapolis, I definitely expect them to let the project team know that. I expect them to let me know that. Um, and uh, in the meantime, I think fighting for those improvements to the route um, is kind of the, the stage of the project that we're in. So, I mean, there was a lot of pushback at one point for that. Is it still pushback? For, the, for the Blue Line project? You know, it's, a, it's, it's like, uh, I, you know, that's a hard question to answer because the, ultimately it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of push to have it on Lindale, um, and that's what got it to move over to Washington, right? Now, there might be critiques about it going down 21st, um, and, you know, I know that the project team is doing uh, public outreach right now. I'm trying to support them to make sure that they're hearing from everybody in, on the north side. Um, but I think that to try to paint the blue line in this box of uh, it's either all good or it's all bad, it's kind of, it oversimplifies the, the, the problem. Here's the thing, if we don't get the transit infrastructure, right, and, and maybe we shouldn't, but let's just say hypothetically we don't. If we don't get the transit infrastructure, then that is a continuation of this legacy of North Minneapolis not getting money, of North Minneapolis not getting invested in. And do we deserve to not be invested in? I think we deserve to be invested in. That's my position. Mm -hmm. So to just say no to the blue line is to say, is to say we're gonna continue racist policies of the past that say North Minneapolis cannot get money. 
That's what it means to say no to the blue line. Now, to say yes to the blue line without making sure that it's a project that won't displace people, that won't, uh, that won't benefit North Minneapolis, is also a huge mistake. So, you, so again, it's not easy like, yes is good, n no it's not good. It's like, we deserve tra transit infrastructure and we have to fight hard to make sure that that transit infrastructure actually serves us. Um, and so it's kind of a lose-lose. If you say no to it, you lose. If you say yes to it without making sure that there's anti-displacement policy, that there's uh, options for businesses to stay afloat, that there are places for businesses to go during construction, then that's also a problem. We got this window to make it the right kind of project. What do you mean by, um, if we say no, it's saying yes to the racist um, things um, that have been in place? I mean, you know the history of North Minneapolis, right? Yeah. Um, people have, you know, there's, there's this thing called divestment. It means that if, you're, if you live in a community um, that isn't valued by the rest of the city, which often black communities are, right? A lot of immigrant communities are. It means your community is not gonna get money. Your community is not gonna get investment. That's been the history of North Minneapolis, right? You go back and look at uh, 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 real, realty maps, realtor maps from 19, I think 37, you'll see that they got North Minneapolis circled. It says Negro slum, right? That's 1937, that's what they were calling North Minneapolis, right? So they built it that way. They built it to be a place where they were gonna put black folks, they were gonna put Hmong folks, they were gonna put, you know, any, any new immigrant group is gonna be in North Minneapolis, all that kind of stuff. If uh, uh, transit infrastructure, if we're the number one riders, I guess I'll ask you the question, if we ride transit the most, why shouldn't we have the best transit infrastructure? I mean, you would think that we should, you know? Right. We should. It's just about where and, and how you know. and how it comes together, yeah, right? Yeah. That's I think that's what I mean by we can we can debate the alignment and we have and we're gonna continue to, but we also have to understand what do we what do we want out of that infrastructure, right? Do we want more stops? Do we wanna make sure that we've got good landscaping, more trees? Do we wanna make sure that businesses uh, get to stay in North Minneapolis? Do we wanna make sure that there are policies that help people not be displaced by uh, developers who might want to try to come in and eat up uh, the, the land around near and around the, the train. The, all those things are the things that we got to, you know, it's kind of a package of policies that got to come together to make sure that it is good infrastructure, right? One concern I know people, uh, I've heard from a couple of people is that, um, you know, how the public safety issue of mm -hmm. bringing the train, you know, the trains, a lot of times, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of not so good people at times, sure. you know, yeah. are able to commute through the train mm -hmm. and that will be coming into our communities even yeah. more and more. What's your thoughts about that? You know, I think that uh, the Metro Transit certainly has to get a hold of public safety on the route, right? Um, but if, you know, I'm on the train kind of often and I remember, I remember especially during COVID and all that stuff, you had homelessness was increasing. Homelessness is, high, is on the rise, right? It continues to be. Uh, we saw, I mean, the opiate crisis is on the rise. Resources were scarce. And so what you had people doing was they were essentially living on the train, right? They hang out on the train as long as they can. Oh, yeah. they, get, uh, they get to, you know, they get to the Mall of America, they hang out as long as they can. Or they get to the, you know, before they get kicked out. Or they get to the airport stop and they hang out as long as they can until they get kicked out. Or, you know, you know that's kind of how people were living their lives, especially with, with the lack of resources. And so... I think in the meantime, if you go on the train today, uh, and I'm on the train a lot, um, you know, I think it feels remarkably different than it did um, in 2021 and 2022. Uh, I think that the safety, I think that our homelessness response is improving. It's not, it's not perfect. Uh, I want it to be a lot better, but I think the city and Metro Transit's homelessness response is getting better. Service delivery is getting better. Uh, but also, you know, I know that enforcement's getting better in terms of fair and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'd have to look at the most recent numbers, but, you know, I remember what it felt like when kind of nobody was on the train and the trains felt really different, felt um, less safe than they used to. And now I'm looking and there's a lot of people on the train all the time The during football games or baseball games, they're packed again. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that we're in a good, I think that we're in, in uh, we're moving in the right direction when it comes to safety and security on the, on the route. I heard you speak to um, like land trust things. Uh, I want to understand what land trusts are, what, the, mm -hmm. what purpose they serve, and um, how they're beneficial to the community. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think earlier I was t more talking about site control, right? So 
you know, I, you're maybe you're referring to buying up land on the or along the, the blue line. Land trusts are kind of separate from that. That's like a housing, mostly a housing uh, tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you work in housing, uh, which, you know, city council certainly does, you learn about, you know, a lot of folks will call what, uh, the housing continuum, right? That means everything from like shelter space to people being secure and owning, right? Uh, I think land trusts are one of those pieces of the housing continuum that are really valuable for, and, and the reason I think that is because, um, you know, there are people who want to buy their home, right? They want to live, they want to have security in their home but they don't have enough uh, money or, uh, uh, you know, or everything that they need in order to buy their own house uh, uh, in, the, in the marketplace, right? And we could talk about that because there's a whole lot of other issues with the housing market right now that we could get into. But land trust specifically um, is often an affordable way for people, everyday people to enter into home ownership. Mm -hmm. I think the downside of them is that when you go to sell your home, you don't get 100% of your equity back, right? That's kind of the, the downside of them. But if you are somebody who is never gonna be able to own a home in the first place, you might be willing to sacrifice a little bit of that uh, equity on the back end in order to have security and ownership on the front end, right? And so I think that it's a, it's a, it can be a good stepping stone. I've heard of folks who have bought land trust homes um, and when they've gone to sold, they've used their 25% or 30% equity as a down payment for the, a new house, right? These are the ways in which I think the land trust can set us up, uh, uh, you know, to, to succeed in the housing continuum and to help aim folks towards uh, home ownership. And there's, there's a lot of other benefits, but I don't want to give an answer that's too long for the, yeah. for the show. Um, you know, you talk about uh, outsiders buying up land and different stuff. Mm -hmm. How do we come to some kind of thing where, you know, uh, residents are getting first dibs at, at, at at purchasing these properties. I see a lot of vacant lots yeah. and all that type stuff. Yeah. No, man, that, that is an issue that I'm actually looking to tackle. Um, and it can be hard to get the political will at City Hall, but there's a policy called tenant opportunity to purchase that I've been working on uh, since my first term. Uh, and there's some, some legal hurdles and there's some logistical hurdles in getting it passed, but uh, it's a policy that I'm currently working on with another council member uh, on the south side, Aisha Chugtai. It's called tenant opportunity to purchase. And what the policy would do is it would say that if you live in a home that's, that you're renting, right? On the north side, we have a lot of single family homes that are rentals, right? It says if you're living in your home and your landlord goes to sell, you have first right to buy that home. Now, you're not gonna get it at a discount, you're not gonna get it at any of that, but you have the first right, which means that you have an opportunity to figure out how can I put my financing together, all, the, all those kinds of things. And so we're trying to create a space where the pathways into home ownership are more and more accessible. Um, you know, this isn't only a Minneapolis problem, but across the country, we're, real, we're seeing this trend of investment firms, some of them in the, you know, from the United States, some of them outside of the United States that are buying up tons of homes, right? Sometimes they're renting them out, sometimes they're not. And it all has to do with some tax trickery that I don't even quite under, wrap my head around. But it's a way that we're kind of being screwed over by the marketplace, right? These free market forces that are kind of eating up home ownership opportunities, driving up the cost of homes, all these things. It's complicated stuff, but what I'm trying to say is that with policies like tenant opportunity to purchase, I think that we could create a little bit of an of a, of a interruption to that cycle that just has these homes changing hands before we can even get um, in the game. But I mean, even, you know, the businesses, the commercial buildings and all of that stuff too. On the oh, oh yeah, commercial buildings. Um, you know, uh, a lot of commercial buildings are uh, on West Broadway especially, and I know that we've got other corridors. We've got Lowry, we've got, you know, Glenwood, we've got other corridors in Plymouth that we want to make sure are, are built up. Um, and Washington even, even though I know sometimes folks don't think of Washington as north side, but I, I think it is. Um, uh, I think the, with, with the commercial space, we've, we've historically been locked out of that. One of the first things that I've uh, worked on when I first got elected way back uh, you know, in 2018, I started working on this with a few people um, at the city. One was a guy in CPED. He's retired now, but his name's Jim Terrell, smart guy. If you can ever get him on the show, he knows this stuff way better than I do. He's a great guy to talk to. Um, but also Sean Pierce, who worked on the North Side for a long time, worked for the mayor at the time that we were working on this. But the three of us got together and we were trying to figure out how we can close this gap 
in commercial ownership for North Siders. And, uh, and what we basically landed on was this thing called the Commercial Property Development Fund. Um, it's a fund that helps close the gap. It won't pay for everything, but if you, got, but if you wanted to buy a building, for example, um, and, uh, and it was gonna cost you a certain amount of money, but you could only get financing and, all, and fundraise to up to a certain amount, this fund will help close the gap so that you could complete your purchase, right? Mm. Um, what is that called? It's called the Commercial Property Development Fund. Okay. And I think the mayor's looking to change the name of it, but uh, you know, I can get that to you later. But as, as of right now, it's called the Commercial Property Development Fund. I'm sure you know people like Kenya McKnight. Mm. Um, the, there's Tri Construction, which is owned by uh, Calvin Littlejohn, who also lives over north, uh, black owned construction company. Um, Jesse Ross, who's a young entrepreneur in the neighborhood, uh, and a few others. I, I'm, I don't mean to leave anybody out, but the fund uh, is it's 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 providing a little bit of assistance to help close a gap, and that little bit of assistance can be the difference between not having enough money and having enough money. Obviously, everybody that I just named, they're all brilliant business people on their own, right? They're all making themselves. The city's not making anybody that didn't already have a lot of creativity and a lot of, uh, a lot of initiative. But what it can do is help close that gap for our local creators, entrepreneurs, business folks to own uh, portions of our commercial corridor. And, I, and you know, it's a relatively new fund. You know, it's not one of those things that has been in existence for a decade. It's, it's a fund that's been around for about four years. I think we had $2.7 million the first year. We had 7.5 the next year. Um, we had 10 million in the during COVID because we had all the ARPA funding, uh, and I'm fighting to have more money in that fund um, uh, uh, in this upcoming budget. And so, you know, uh, but it's called the Commercial Property Development Fund. I'm trying to let everybody on the north side that I know know about it so that we can um, really help our folks own the corridor and, and start to create the kind of thriving uh, corridors that we deserve. Uh, you know, and it's not only for West Broadway. It's you know Washington. Glenwood, Lowry, any any of our uh, commercial commercial nodes. Uh, switch gears just a little bit. Um, uh, I seen a video of you uh, a while back. Uh, you know, you had your long hair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're very critical of the Minneapolis police. Mm -hmm. um, where are you at with that? What's your how are your thoughts towards the police, yeah. Minneapolis police, right now? I remain critical. I, I think everybody should be critical. I'm critical of public works. I'm critical of regulatory services, I'm critical of the mayor, I'm critical of myself. I think everybody should remain critical. Um, here's the thing, we're in the business of, of, of providing services to our constituents. Shouldn't we be demanding a high level of service at all times? Sure. I, I, that, I think so. <clears throat> and I think that when you look at um, all of the services that the city provides, um, you know, where, where we have seen breakdowns in good service and where the consequences have been extremely high have been with MPD, right? Now, does that mean that I hate every single officer? Is I, you know, that's politics. That's, that's people trying to put words in your mouth, right? But it does mean that uh, we should be demanding a high level of service. You know, in 2021, it got conflated into, oh, you just, you hate the police, right? Quote, unquote, you just hate the police which, you know, I think is, is a little bit silly. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, it's politics, right? That's how, that's how, that's how uh, things go. Um, but I would never let anything, uh, you know, uh, prevent me from being hypercritical of the city of Minneapolis, even though I'm a part of the city of Minneapolis. You know, I signed up to make sure that we can improve service delivery, that we can improve safety. Uh, and so if I see failures of safety, all that kind of stuff. Of course, I'm gonna be a collaborator. Um, like I said, like I've got a lot of faith in people like, you know, Inspector Adams, uh, you know, a lot of people who know me well know that I go way back with, uh, you know, former, um, uh, former Deputy Chief Art Knight. Uh, you know, these are people that I really believe in. At the same time, um, you gotta be critical of these systems or else they won't improve, or else we're gonna have more George Floyds, or else we're gonna have more situations that we had with ketamine, or else we're gonna have rape kits that continue to go untested and, un, you know, uh, and, and cases that go unsolved. And so it's, you gotta be a collaborator, you gotta be solutions oriented, um, absolutely. But I think you also gotta make sure that you're, you're critical and demanding a high, a high level of service. 
So I mean, like you know, with the whole fund funding and defunding of the police, mm -hmm. uh, Minneapolis Police Department, mm -hmm. where you at with that? I don't even understand the question. The whole thoughts around funding or defunding the police. Like right. What What is your thoughts? Um, are you for defunding it still, or are you for? You'd have to quote. You got a quote for me? Any quote for me where I said <laughs> I was going to take? Well, I know. I I believe that I you had a quote where you were in support of defunding. I don't have any quote that says anything like that, but here's what I said. Well, what is your position on funding or defunding, I should say? Here's my thing. I do think that the police have an enormous share of, uh, of, the, uh, of the city budget. They have an enormous share of the city budget, right? Um, and if they're, if they're going to have an enormous share of the city budget, they either need to be able to do everything, or if they can't do everything, then we've still got to be able to fund things that need to get done in the city. Mm -hmm. For example, we created the Office of Violence Prevention so that it could take work off of the police's plate, right? We created the, uh, we created the Behavioral Crisis Response Team so that, it so that it could take work off of the police's pay plate, right? The police aren't in the business of crime prevention. They're not in the business of violence prevention. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, if the police can't be in, they're in the business of catching, uh, uh, holding people accountable, after they've committed a harm, right? That can't be the only way that we have safety in our city. I don't want to live in a city where, I, where we wait until I'm harmed or we wait until my loved ones are harmed before we can start to have some level of justice, right? I want to live in a city where we can have violence prevention so that people don't have to be harmed at all. I want to live in a city where, uh, uh, where people who are going through a mental health crisis, instead of being shot and killed, uh, the way that... Uh, uh, Travis Jordan was uh, when he was going through a mental health crisis that we have a service that can support those people and create safety in the neighborhood it's never safe when a gun's going off right uh, it's never safe when a gun's going off it, it's never safe I don't think it's ever safe when a gun is drawn so the more that we can have a portion of our public safety that does not require those things I think the safer we are yeah. I think that I think it makes the police's job safer in order for us to expand how we keep each other safe in our communities. So that's what I've been fighting for. You know, I think all that other stuff is, is politics. Like I said, you go back, you can Google any quote that you ever had from me. You know, uh, my message has always been clear. We need to expand public safety. Does that mean that the police, uh, does that mean that sometimes the police budget is gonna have to be a part of how we achieve an expanded public safety? Sure, uh, you know, but, uh, but if you wanna go and find a quote from me that says, something crazy, you're just not gonna, like, like even now, you couldn't quote me because it doesn't exist, right? Mm. Um, and if you go back and look, you, you still won't be able to. So you, I think so that people not... should, I think that people should, I think that people should be focused on safety instead of uh, politics. So you're not against um, the police department getting funding, you just, in addition to the police department, you would like to see some of these other de-escalation. I think there are deep, deep problems with the police department. Mm -hmm. And I think that anybody that doesn't also think that um, is out of step with reality. If you look at the DOJ, the Department of Justice, you don't have to take my word for it, right? You don't have to take my word for it. If you look at the Department of Justice, they're, they're not coming and doing a, a, a federal consent decree against MPD because I told them to. They're not coming and doing a federal consent decree against MPD because, uh, because, for, because it's fun. They're doing it because there is a deep pattern of racist and sexist service delivery mm -hmm. from MPD, right? The state didn't do, the State Department of, um, of Human Rights didn't do a consent decree because it's fun. And they didn't do it because I asked them to. They did it because the problem is there, the problem is undeniable, right? So I think when people wanna get locked into a rhetorical political battle of defund, defund, or no defund, or what do you stand on that? I got to ask myself, what are we talking about? Are we talking about more safety or not? Because I'm talking about more safety mm. always, <clears throat> right? That's where I'm at. And, and having a racist department, having a department that's unaccountable, having a department that we never say no to when it comes to funding, that's not more safety, right? Having a department that's underfunded, Having a department that doesn't have enough people to do the kind of job that we need them to do, that doesn't contribute to more safety either, right? But to just lock into 
more or less money, and that's the only conversation we're going to have, that's, that's cult behavior. That's not, real, that's not a real political discussion. That's not, that's not a real conversation about how do we keep each other safe. Wow. Um, with the violence um, inter interrupters, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, in the various groups, mm -hmm. uh, have, you saw the, have you saw that help in the community? What's your thoughts with, with their services? Yeah, you know, I, I think that those groups do tremendous work, and anybody who wants to, you know, I love, like I've done ride-alongs with MPD. I've done ride-alongs with EMTs uh, and EMS at the county. Um, I plan to do ride-alongs with behavioral crisis response team. Um, I think people should go and do ride-alongs or walk-alongs with these groups as well, mm -hmm. so you can see the kinds of um, uh, things that they're, the kinds of incidents that they're intervening on. Uh, I think that their work is really important, but their work is also really new, right? Uh, you know, like I said, we've had, or you know, I think to the, there's a point where we've had MPD as a public service uh, out of the city for 150 years, over 150 years. And we're still kind of figuring out how to improve that, right? The, this new violence interrupter model has been in existence for three years. So obviously we're gonna, it, we're gonna have to still take some time to figure out how we improve it, how we make sure that we uh, um, have enough people out there, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think it's a body of work that needs to continue to grow. I think it's a body of work that has a lot of value. And, um, you know, and three years is not a ton of time to figure out, you know, um, uh, exactly how to perfect that model, uh, but it is enough time for us to figure out how much of an impact are we having. Um, it's also enough time for us to figure out, are we giving it enough funding, right? Uh, as it stands, the, the, the groups that we fund, they're independent groups, they're only paid part-time, um, they're not paid through, they're not uh, employed through the city, they're employed through contracted uh, organizations, which means that we don't have a guarantee uh, that they got long lasting benefits and all these other things. And so I think when you're asking people to put their bodies on the line to keep other people safe, you know, there should be a certain level of job security. And so I think in addition to figuring out into studying how are they doing, we should also be trying to figure out how secure is this work, right? Uh, because having a, a, in terms of employment, because having security in the job is gonna lead to a better result. It's gonna lead to more people wanting to do the job and better, better candidates who wanna do the job. So how are they, I mean, I'm asking, um, mm -hmm. how are they protected? You know, like some, some goes down in the, in the neighborhood while they're, while they're there yep. and they have to intervene yeah. and something, you know, is there anything around that? For yeah, them? well, you know, they're, they're, they're very intentionally not the police, right? Yeah. So I think if, if, if they get into a situation that is outside of their scope of service, we don't want any of them putting themselves in a situation where they are guaranteed to be harmed, right? Mm -hmm. They're unarmed. They're out there, uh, most of them, on the strength of their relationships out on the street, right? And so the, I think that for most of them, they're in neighborhoods that they, they're in, in, that they know and understand. They're in a context that they know and understand. And so they're trying to intervene uh, in a situation well before um, it is uh, at the point of eminent violence, right? If you get to a situation that is at the point of eminent violence, you know, that's outside of their scope of service, right? At that point, yeah. 911 needs to be called and all that kind of stuff. So I think that they've got training on when, on how to identify a situation that they're capable of. They've got training on how to um, get ahead of a situation so that they're intervening in violence well before it's at the point of imminent violence. Um, but like I said, it's a three-year program and we're gonna continue to examine it, vet it, and improve it. If you had to name, um you know, a lot of times we wish that we know what we know now. We knew then. Mm -hmm. You know, um, six years. Mm -hmm. What would you What would you say you've learned um, now as a result of the work that you wish you had known? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I came into this work knowing that I didn't know everything about it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think I, I I always anticipated that there was going to be a degree of learning on the job that was just going to have to happen, and so I accepted that from day one. I don't know that there's been anything that surprised me. Um, in terms of the work itself, you know, I do think that the, um, you know, obviously if you could go back and, and, and know that uh, something like the murder of George Floyd was gonna happen, you know, you'd wanna go back and prevent something like that. Obviously, if you could go back and understand how the pandemic was gonna destroy the economy and what, what kind of effect that was gonna have on violence in the community, on people's long-term employment, on people's housing security, you know, you always wish that you could have been a little bit more prepared for those things. But 
in terms of, uh, you know, what do I wish I knew? I know, I know so much now that I didn't know coming in. Um, but I can't say that there's like one thing that I wish I knew with certainty um, coming in. Uh, I'm very studious. Anybody who knows me knows that I read a lot. All my colleagues know that I'm going through my, my briefings. I'm having meetings. I'm trying to understand the situation at a level that, it's, that most people don't understand any situation. And that's with all my work. That's with every policy I've ever passed. That's with housing. That's with economic development. That's with safety. That's with climate justice, you know, uh, which is an issue that affects North Minneapolis, I think, at a really high level. Um, I'm trying to understand what are the barriers to, to improving our lives, right? Every single time you've got an, a situation uh, that's a problem for the community and you ask yourself, why is that a problem for us? There's always so many layers of sometimes it's valid, sometimes it's illegal, sometimes it's just BS, right? There's so many layers uh, to every situation um, uh, that make them hard to, that make problems hard to solve. Uh, and if you never understand and you never go deep, then you'll never understand a situation. You'll never understand how to imp improve housing accessibility and housing affordability. You'll never underst understand how to improve housing inspections. You'll never understand how to um, increase commercial ownership like we talked about earlier. But if, you, but if you're curious and you're creative and you listen to people in the community, um, then you can kind of expand your knowledge. The residents of North Minneapolis collectively, Ward 5 collectively, is always gonna be so much smarter than I am, right? That's why it's so important for, for me to have, um, you know, for, for me to be in touch on the ground uh, so, that I can, so that I can be the best representative uh, that I can be. Yeah, um, a lot of people will say, we don't find out about things until it's too late. You know, things are already, plans are already in motion. Mm -hmm. um, how do we find out about these resources and how, how do we stay involved to know things before, you know, know th about yeah, things yeah, yeah. at the start? You know, well, certainly there's like, there's small, there's small steps you could take, right? So for instance, I put out a newsletter every two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody in North Minneapolis is on my newsletter, right? So if folks want to go to the mini to you know the, the city website, sign up for the newsletter, you're certainly going to get a lot of information. We put it out every two weeks. We put a lot of Northside information in that newsletter. Uh, but I also think that there is a level of um, of uh, there's there's a degree of engagement. Um, where we are convinced that we're getting to the game too late, but we're actually not. And I think the blue line that we talked about at the top of this is a good example of that. People thought that, you know, when, when the route was going to go down Lindale, people already thought they're like, well, you know, they're forcing it down us, right? They're forcing it on us. The decision's made. And, you know, I felt like I wanted to, I wanted folks to understand the decision wasn't made, that they, if they kept showing up and they kept making their case uh, and they advocated, that they were gonna get the kind of change that they wanted to see. And that's what happened. The blue line's still in that phase, right? Where people can speak up, they can say exactly what they wanna see, and we're gonna continue to fight to get improve improvements on that project. But I think every project's like that, right? I wanna make sure that folks on the North Side are never convinced that the decision's just made and that, you know, uh, and that there's nothing for them to do. Um, sometimes we can intervene on these situations. Um, you know, uh, and so anyway, I, I think that it's, I think that um, the city has this complaint based system, right? You call 311, you make a complaint, that's how things get changed. Uh, but, uh, but the city takes, takes in volumes of complaints, right? I always want folks to know that they should call, not only call 311, call my office, have your neighbors call 311, uh, because we have a complaint based system. It's imperfect, but it's the system that we have. And so, uh, staying engaged with my office. I have weekly open office hours in addition to the newsletter. Um, I, I've talked to thousands of people that way over the years, you know, uh, people who just pop into my open office hours every Monday uh, from noon to one. And so, uh, and so there's various ways to get involved, you know, but there's also gonna be a degree of, of, uh, of um, it's hard to know things in general, right? Like I even think about, you know, uh, Movies come out, they got millions of dollars worth of advertising, but sometimes we still never hear those movies, right? Uh, and, and, and for the city, we don't have millions of dollars of advertising, right? And so I think that it, it really does take a lot of neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conversations in order for uh, uh, us to get the word out about what's happening in the community. Yeah. Um, one, of your, <coughs> one of your constituents um, was critical about how, uh, how quick you were able to get back to mm -hmm. community members. Um, 
what is your process and is there is there do you try to get back at a certain time period or should people how should people when yeah, they reach yeah. out what should they be waiting on yeah yeah you know um historically look we got 35,000 people in north minneapolis right 35,000 people in ward 5 um and uh and there has been a long history of the city council seat where the number of people who reach out to actually get support from the Ward 5 office has historically been really small. The thing that I've been working on for the past six years is to expand the number of people who are reaching out to the office because I don't want people to feel like they don't have access to, to, to my office, right? And we have expanded who has access to this office. You go look at our data. I'm not gonna remember it off the top of my head. I wish I brought my, my notes here with it, but we put out a report about our data. Um, we get the highest number of complaints out of the city, which is a thing that I think is, is a good thing because more people complaining means that more things are getting done, right? We get the highest number of constituent cases. We resolve the highest number of constituent cases, right? I'm the, you know, uh, we have a weekly newsletter. Not every council member has that, or sorry, bi-weekly newsletter. We have a weekly open office hours that I, that, I'm, that I personally sit through. We've talked to thousands of constituents that way. Um, not every, not every uh, ward office has that. Before COVID, we had, uh, we had quarterly people's assemblies. And so I think it's really important that we put in perspective um, that uh, when it comes to constituent services, there is not like, uh, you know, I want people to understand this. When it comes to constituent services, there's not a single ward in the city of Minneapolis, all 13 wards, that is doing more than my office. Now, does that mean that, uh, that there are not sometimes backlogs where we're struggling to get to everybody, right? It's me and two people in my office. That's who handles all the constituent cases, right? If, uh, if, uh, and that's it with every ward, right? Every ward has one council member and two staff, right? But we've got the most, we've got the most, uh, most cases. So we're, and we're resolving the most cases. So, I think it's a big point of pride for me to know that more Northsiders have access to my office than ever in the history of this office. Uh, and I want people to know that. Um, and, uh, and we do try to get back to everybody. Um, and I make it a mission to get back to everybody. And there's a mix of things, right? Sometimes people fall through the cracks, we fall short, right? And I always take accountability for when we fall short. If we didn't get back to someone, if we didn't get back to, uh, to, to, to an email. Uh, and when people tell me that in the community, I go back and I look, I'm, I'm like, where did we miss this, right? Um, I'll also say though, there are times where I'll hear people say, I reached out to you and you didn't get back to me. And I'll say, oh man, I'm really sorry. Tell me your email, tell me your name. And I'll go search it. I say, I'm not really finding anything from you. And they'll say, actually, I didn't actually email you, but I heard that you didn't get back to people. <laughs> and so I, I'm saying that like, I'm not, you know, I always want to be held accountable. Yeah. I actually love being <clears throat> held accountable. It makes me it makes me a better council member. It makes me a better public servant, right? You kind of have to to be in this position. You got you got to, yeah. right? But I also I also got to, you know, I think there also has to be a little bit of acknowledgement that like Ward 5, it's a high needs ward. When people are calling, people don't call their city council member to tell me I'm doing a great job, right? They call me when they're frustrated, right? They call me when they're having when something wrong when something is going wrong in their community. And so I think that sometimes that frustration can lead to a little bit of a rumor mill, right? Um, um, but, uh, but I just continue to p tell people, keep reaching out to my office. We get back the most, we resolve the most cases. Um, uh, uh, my team and I have done a tremendous job on that front, uh, but we still wanna be held accountable um, and we wanna pick up the slack when we have fallen short. Um, personal question. Yeah. Um, you know, you come from a long legacy of uh, political leaders. Mm -hmm. um, how, what's the pros of that? And also, what, first, what's the pros of, of you know, being the son of yeah, Keith yeah. Ellison in yeah, your position? For sure. You know, I like to think it's actually a pretty short legacy because he's only been elected since, you know, like, 06. I guess he got elected 02. <laughs> so, you know, we, you know, we're, we're, you know, he's 20 years been into, into his public service. He's been on the ground for a while. He's been on the ground for a Yeah, you know, he got here in, he got here in 87. Uh, he got to Minnesota in 87. For folks that don't know, my dad's from Detroit. My parents are from Detroit. Um, and, you know, my mom's has served on the, on the school board and, and uh, and uh, you know, uh, our family share that in common as well, that care for education and, and, and service. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that it has, it has put some things in perspective for me that I think are really valuable. You know, one of the things that my parents taught me was that these seats are not ours, right? The, the, the Ward 5 city, uh, city Council seat is not my seat, right? It's the people's seat, always. Uh, and I've always gotta be willing to, uh, 
to, to be honest and to stand true to what I think is, is right. That means that I'm never going to lie to people in order to keep this job. I'm never going to betray my values in order to keep this job because it was never mine in the first place. Right. Um, it, you know, and, and sometimes there are things that, that I work on, right. Some in the past, my views on public safety or, you know, my advocacy for, um, you know, people who are unhoused, it's frustrating people because they don't understand where I'm coming from or they might not understand my position. But if I have to lose an election because I'm advocating for better, more dignified housing, I'm advocating for people who are unhoused. If I got to lose an election because I'm advocating for better public safety services, uh, I could live with that. Right. If I start to compromise my values in order to try to keep this seat, that's not something that I could live with. And I think that that's something that both my parents have taught me really well. Uh, and so I, I love this job. I love being able to serve. But if I ever uh, if I ever had if I ever lost an election, I'd be OK. Right. And I'd continue to serve the community in some other way. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you showing up, though. And, um, you know, I know I'll never be able to ask every question. You sure. Know, for but, sure. But I appreciate the transparency. Yep. Um, if you got any closing remarks, you know, where to find you, you know, what um, for what sure. do the people need to know before November 7th? Yeah. You know, um, you know, I know we weren't able to cover every single issue. You know, like I mentioned, a uh, lot of work that I'm doing on climate justice, a lot of work on housing uh, that, and home ownership, specifically closing the, the uh, uh, home ownership gap uh, is a really important thing. Uh, getting more black homeowners is really important to me. Uh, we did talk a lot about economic development. We didn't talk as much about job creation, which is something I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. A few projects that I'm moving there as well. Um, I think people need to know that uh, I'm working hard. Uh, that I'm advocating for them every single day, uh, that I know what the issues are, and, uh, and that when you reach out to my office, even if it's something that the city council doesn't take on, even if you're calling and it's really a state issue or a county issue, you're going to get service, you're going to get support from my office in some way. We're going to point you in the right direction. We're not going to leave you hanging or, or send you off to make another phone call. Uh, uh, that's really important to me. That's the level of service I think the North Side des uh, deserves. I'm born and raised on the North Side. You can find me on Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, you can go to the city website and, uh, and, and, and get on the newsletter. Uh, and the election is coming up uh, October 7th. And uh, I hope that everybody gets out and they vote. Um, you know, obviously, I think that I represent North Side values. I, I represent, um, uh, you know, a history of the North Side because I'm born and raised there. Uh, but regardless of where you stand, I want people to make sure that they have their voices heard, um, especially if you live on the North Side. Yeah, I appreciate you, and I would love to have future conversations. Let's you know, do like it. I said, we can never one setting is never enough. You know, for sure, for sure. Um, again, we're trying to inform our voters, inform yep. um, the young adults demographic specifically with, yep. with what we're doing here. So a lot of people don't know. A lot of people need to be informed. Of, of course. So appreciate you coming out. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. No problem. No problem. You heard it here on Address It, a current city city um, council member, War Five. Thank you. But they won't show us right It's really on us who we let represent us We need a face that's familiar Not one that's never with us He owns some buildings over north But this not where he stay He ain't worried about his house Getting hit up with a stray He ain't gotta worry about his kids Dying while they play I just don't think him and us Is built the same Look, we need real change Not just rhetoric And we ain't drawing off of names Who really stepping in Hey, we can They touch me It's consequences that come with that I call you next Hey, Lee, they trying to steal our shit. I feel like a lot of people took away the negative from that. This is what I can lie. It's trademark, and I own the trademarks, and it's public record. Like, ain't nobody got to lie about, bro. I pull up I, 20 niggas with ski masks. Like, super hate. Like, ain't nobody trying to hear you not on the street, nigga. But she ain't never paid for not one of them. I'm not finna die for this shit. I'm trying to get out. Hey, dad, I'm trying to get out for this shit. Man, he had potential to I ain't never up. touched none of y'all. I ain't never did. I don't owe y'all any shit. I don't owe y'all any shit. She said, I killed a boy. I'm going to prison. You can out-internet me, but you can't out-business me and, and out-grind me.